So the Midway Carrier Battle. As you can see, the goal of Japan is to establish dominance, and they have every expectation of doing so. And if you were a betting man, which is where I'll be next week on your spring break in Las Vegas, <laughs> you'd have every reason to bet on the Japanese. However, there's always that however. Japan would suffer from something called victory disease. They had been very successful up to this point. Remember we talked about their endeavors in Manchuria, mainland China, throughout the South Pacific, and of course, Pearl Harbor. They've been very successful. Why was Midway not a success? Well, several reasons. One is they didn't keep it simple. They were very, very overly complicated. They sent a diversionary force up toward the Aleutian Islands, and sometimes straying from simplicity, could be a problem. And again, the divided force. While they had a powerful Navy, as well as their Air Force attached to it, when they're divided, they're not nearly as strong. And you've got to understand that technology is working on our side at this point. We're breaking their code that they're not aware of. So there's several reasons, but I think more than one. The, if I had to bet on one, it would like to be right at the top. Overconfidence. So this would be an astounding American victory. How so? Well, Japan's goal was to destroy the U.S. fleet. That was far from the truth, and as John just said, we'd spend the next three years putting Japan on the defensive. Overnight, their numerical advantage disappeared. And like I say, for three years, it would take us to reclaim the Pacific. This was greatly needed for all the obvious military reasons, but also for morale. American morale needed this victory. We truly did. You could argue that every casualty is a, a loss, not a victory, but certainly when you look at these numbers, and particularly the, ca the carriers, Japan sacrificed four of their carriers in very much a losing effort. And if you notice, I've got under Japan their planes and their pilots. They suffered a similar challenge that Germany did. They could not replace their pilots. Replacing their, pla their planes were challenging, but the pilots, having trained aircraft pilots, was really becoming difficult for them. And as we would learn later in the war, there'd be a reason for their change of tactics. So when you look at this map, we start over on uh, our right here, and we see Pearl Harbor, and it's nothing but a continual pushback the entire way. Now remember, when this is happening, you don't know it's going to take three years. You don't know if it's going to take three months or another decade. You don't know that the future battles would virtually all go toward the Americans. But certainly after the loss of Pearl Harbor, this was a huge success, and we would start that pushback. And now, really, America is in the war. Really, you can call this game on, particularly in the Pacific, and because we don't know it's going to be overwhelming victories, we know that the numerical advantage has gone away, and now we're looking at two even competitors in the Pacific, which probably brings us back to Admiral Yamamoto. Remember I mentioned him last week, and he was the chief, the, 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 the chief admiral for the Japanese, who had studied at Harvard, and he studied American industrial capacity. He was a professor at Harvard in the 30s, and probably knew as well as anyone on this planet what the American industrial capacity was. And it was he who uttered those words, we've awakened the sleeping giant. So that's all I've got right now. What we're going to do is change a little bit. We're going to bring uh, Dr. Frank Marzak up here. He is, of course, the director of the museum. And he's going to announce another special guest and pre special presentation that we have. Thank you, Chris. The Submarine Museum has a board of directors. Uh, we have 14 members strong. We have three submariners on the board. 
two of them who are from the World War II era. And one of them is here tonight, his name is Don Morell. And Don is going to speak to you for a few minutes. Don was 17 years old when he went into the Navy in 1944. He served aboard the submarine, the USS Chubb, and on two war patrols, served there five, for five months, and left the Navy, left the service on May 17th of 1946. He and his wife, Margaret, been married for 51 years, I think, did you say? Margaret, you're hiding in the back. That's Margaret back there. She has me here at every meeting. And uh, Don completed his career working in this part of the world and in the air conditioning business along with Margaret. So, from that era, Don Morrell, would you please come up? If you're lucky, Don may even tell you about torpedo juice, but I don't want to break his bolt, so there you are. <laughs> <laughs> 